thank you everybody for the, those of you who have stayed. Those of you who are leaving, you might want to um, consider that Jim, Jim's actually an investor in innovation as well, um, in terms of what we do. We're a, uh, I just heard the tail end of the speech, and a lot of that's very sort of forward-looking and future-looking in, in terms of uh, investing and, and where it comes. We're actually a very old-school business in terms of we own assets, which are aircraft, and we simply rent them to airlines. Um, it's, a, it's an industry that is um, uh, going from strength to strength, obviously, with the growing population, with millennials. Uh, the things that they are doing is uh, they might not be buying cars, they might not be buying houses, um, but they're certainly travelling more. And so our business is a very simple business. What I'll try to do over the next 20 minutes is just, for those people who haven't heard of the business, um, just explain the very simple business model um, that we uh, operate on. I'll talk about uh, a fresh set of results that were released on the 26th of February. And then I'll actually talk about the future in terms of why this company is investable, what our growth strategy, strategy is and how we're going to increase earnings for share price and how typically um, over the 12 years of our history that's actually generated significant um, capital growth for shareholders. Um, so we are a company that's been around for 12 years. Um, uh, on average, you, the reason to buy this stock is that it's a, it's a growth stock and, by, and that means that the share price goes up. So what we do is that we buy planes. On average, over the last six years, we've grown our fleet by a cumulative annual growth rate of over 30% per year. That's 30% per year growth. There won't be too many companies that you'll have ever heard of that's able to sustain that sort of growth. And the share price has followed that. Because you build your fleet, you generate rent from those planes, that generates revenue, that, which generates earnings per share, which drives the share price. It's really as simple as that. I've been attending this conference now for, I think, five years. Um, the company's just um, achieved a record fleet level of a billion dollars, which is the title of the speech. Um, when I first came here five years ago, I think the fleet level was about $300 million. So in five years, we've gone from 300 to a billion. Uh, we've tripled our earnings. We've tripled the share price. It's really as simple as that. So our business model is to buy commercial passenger aircraft. We've got a whole lot of people coming in. I think all the people leaving, Jim, was, has held the people coming in to see, see me. So we'll give them a chance to come in because there are quite a, there is a few people there. While those people sit down, I'd, thank, I'd just like to thank Jim, actually. Like, we got involved in this. We got involved and we've been very strong supporters of Master Investor now for, for five years. Um, I've already had a dozen shareholders come to me, um, most of them who bought three or four years ago and have literally doubled their money by buying this stock. This is one of the few um, opportunities for retail investors to get access to companies, which is why we've supported it for so long and continue to support it. Um, I think that with Mifid 2, with um, brokers not really knowing what they're doing at the moment, it's very difficult for ordinary investors to get access to quality companies. I think this forum is one of the great ones to do it. So, you know, we come here because it introduces us to people. We've got a great company um, and, uh, and part of the thing that we've been doing for five years is actually educating people about our company, educating people about aircraft leasing, you know, when I spoke here five years ago, I, told, I said to people, you know, do you know that half the planes on the planet are actually leased by the airlines? British Airways doesn't own its own planes. It leases from companies like us. And companies like us make plenty of money. You know, the simple fact of the matter in the aircraft leasing industry is this. And this is, this is economics 101. And this is the absolute... And it's all you need to hear in the next two minutes is what you need to hear right now. Global passenger traffic grow, grew last year at 7.5%. You can check that from IATA. That's just the demand for aircraft. Boeing and Airbus are one of the very few effective duopolies on Earth. In effect, so they control all the supply of aircraft. 98% of all passenger aircraft are supplied by Boeing and Airbus. And they're only increasing production rates at 5% a year. So if 
The demand for planes is growing at 7% a year and the supply of planes is growing at 5 and they can't grow it any faster because they have hundreds if not thousands of supplies and there are millions of parts in aircraft so it is difficult to up production by the rates to, to match the demand. And that's why aircraft values are high, lease rates are high and there is not going to be a disruptor to this industry for the next 20 years. The Chinese and the Russians are trying to build planes but if you are Michael O'Leary at Ryanair flying hundreds of um, Boeing aircraft with hundreds or thousands of pilots trained to fly Boeing aircraft with hundreds of mechanics trained to fix Boeing aircraft and hundreds of millions of dollars of Boeing spares, are you going to go and buy a Chinese aircraft? You, know, you may over the next 20 years, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. So it's a very simple... That's all you need to know. If you believe in that economics 101 view of supply and demand, this is a great industry to be in. So what we do is we buy our, our business model very simple. We like to buy young or brand, brand new or young aircraft and we put them on long-term leases. And we consider these, we consider planes to be flying real estate. And by that I mean buying an aircraft is a lot like buying a flat to let. Um, you know, you go to the bank and borrow money to buy that plane, you put a tenant in there and they help pay off the mortgage. The analogy breaks down like this in, in, because this is a far better investment. The yield on an aircraft is 12% a year. That means if you buy a $100 million aircraft, you'll generate $12 million a year of rent. Now, I don't know any property investment that does 12% a year. The other thing that airlines do, they're happy to sign 10 and 12 year leases. And think about it. If you get 12% a year for 10 years, you've got back 120% what you paid for the plane. If you could buy an apartment, that paid itself off in 10 years, you'd buy every single one you could. But that's what these assets do. And that's our simple business model. That's all that we do. And we grow our fleet by 30% a year. So we're based in Singapore where we pay a 10% corporate tax rate, which is dropping to 8% next year. Um, everything we do um, is in US dollars. So we buy and sell planes, we rent them, we finance them. So we've got no um, exposure to that. We're we obviously use a lot of bank debt and other debt to, to buy the plane, so we're a leveraged business model. But we fix all, we, we, we fix all our um, debt at um, fixed or hedged interest rates. Because if we sign a 10-year lease, it'll be at a fixed rate per month. You know, that $100 million plane will generate a million dollars a month for 10 years. But if we get, so what we do is we'll get a 10-year bit of debt that amortises to zero, so it pays itself off, and we'll fix those interest rates. So that plane is set and forget, has no exposure to rising interest rates. Our business is a keep it simple, stupid model. It's worked for us for 12 years. The share price history of this company has gone from 4p to £2.20. The theme of the, of the speech is that we just hit a billion dollars of assets, it's taken us 12 years to do that. We're now looking, but we bought $300 million of assets in December alone. So we are looking for the next billion dollars of assets and when we deliver that, the earnings will double, the revenues will double and the share price will follow. So right now we have 37 aircraft. Um, we have one of the, they are, planes live for about 25 years to generate income. We like the young stuff and we've got one of the youngest fleets in the world was 2.9 years old and they got 7.9 years to run on the leases on average. We're now operating with 12 airlines. We've upped that from eight six months ago. Um, we're listed on the stock exchange and we've got to, uh, people who have been doing what we've been doing for, for 12 years. We've only got 20 employees. We've got some lawyers, financiers, sales guys. And all we do is focus on buying the next plane. Because all that we do as a lessor um, is collect a rent check from the airline a month. The airlines do the maintenance. The airlines pay for the insurance. We literally pick up a rent check per month. It's as simple as that. So the snapshot of the company is this. We've got 37 aircraft operating in nine different countries with 12 different airlines. The new airlines that we've added on are the best, um, uh, credit, uh, best credit strengths that we've ever had. We invest in um, all types of commercial passenger aircraft from small $20 million turboprops, which we made our name in, to we've just started buying wide body aircraft such as a brand new Boeing 777, the most popular wide body aircraft in the history of aircraft. Um, and we only buy popular planes because you're asking yourself already, okay, does this, is this too good to be true? What are the risks in this business? Well, the risks in the business are two key ones. One is an air, your airline goes bust and stops paying your rent. It's happened to us twice in our history. 
If you have a popular plane, you take that plane and transition it seamlessly to a, uh, to a new airline that wants that plane. We did that in August last year when Air Berlin went bust. Within a month, it was with EasyJet. So we got a better customer out of it. Um, the second risk is the residual value of the asset because, you know, we're buying assets, we have to sell them. We only buy the popular aircraft with long waiting lists that all the airlines use um, that have been manufactured, all of the planes that we have have been manufactured for over 20 years. So you can plot the residual value history so you know what you're going to sell. And in our 12-year history, we've sold 18 planes. We've made profits on 17 of them. So obviously we're buying right. Our IP, why we're good at what we do, is that we have strict and rigorous investment criteria. That's all that we do. We own a portfolio of yield producing assets. We are simply an investor, but we choose this industry and these particular assets. The fleet, as I said, is 2.9 years old. They've got um, eight years to run on the leases. If those 37 planes run these leases, they will collect $860 million of contracted uh, revenue over that eight years. Um, and we've got over a billion dollars worth of planes. And we've got plenty of growth in the future because we've got options to buy another $600 million of planes. So we can grow the fleet by 60% just by exercising those options. On the 26th of February, we released our half-year result. And the half-year result was actually flat, which is why the share, I think it's great um, um, buying at the moment as a stock. Because a lot of people just look at top line and bottom line and think, oh, that wasn't that flash. What we've told all our shareholders and what we were very clear about telling people is that in June last year, we sold $100 million worth of planes. So we started our financial year, which is 1 July, with a smaller fleet. So we're generating smaller revenues, which is what led to a flat EPS. But by December, selling that $100 million worth of planes enabled us to buy $300 million worth of planes. To take us, that's record growth for us, to take us to a record fleet of over a $1 billion. And from 1 January, all of those planes are now generating rent. And in fact, we've given the clearest guidance that we've ever got given in the history of this company about how much revenue we're generating. And right now, we're picking up $9.6 million a month in rent from those billion dollars worth of planes. Now, we reported for the first six months of the year $42 million revenue. The second half, 9.6 times 6, is $57.5 million revenue. Now, I know that shareholders will not buy the stock now. They'll wait till we print that number in the annual report, the 57.5, to generate 110. They'll go, oh, why didn't I buy that in January? Well, you know, the news is happening right now. You know, we've bought the fleet, we paid for the planes, they're, they're flying today, they're generating rent today. This is the time to buy the stock. And our history, if you follow our history over six or seven years, you'll see that the fleet growth generates revenue growth, generates share price growth, and we've just delivered record growth. So if that's not a buying signal, I don't know what is. Um, alongside that, we've lowered our cost of debt. So as I said, the simple business is that we get from our investment 12% yield and we pay now 4.8% cost of debt. So it's a big net interest margin. That's what banks do. But they don't generate 7% net interest margin. So the operational highlights last year I've already touched on. We delivered four aircraft in December worth almost $300 million. The annualised revenue run rate is 115. I think we reported $92 million last year. So year on year, another big leap. Um, I think when I started speaking here, our revenues were about $35 million a year and we had $300 million worth of planes. So we've tripled in size. The share price has tripled as well. And I know that there are shareholders in the audience today who bought back then. And so they've done really well. We are looking for the next billion dollars worth of assets now. Um, the popularity of the aircraft was proven when Air Berlin, which was one of our customers, went bankrupt last year, and within a month we transitioned that plane to EasyJet. If you deal in pop, it's just like if you've got a, a, a flat in a popular suburb. If your tenant stops paying your rent and moves out, you know you can rent that flat really, really quickly. Very simple, very simple concepts. And we've delivered our first big aircraft, the wide body. Um, we bought an Airbus A330 and a, and a Boeing 777. We added four customers, which are probably the four uh, strongest customers we've ever had in our history. We've got access to unsecured debt. Um, and we're, as I said at the very beginning, we're a growth company, which means that we take all our spare cash and we invest in new planes to keep the, the, the growth company, uh, to keep the growth going. And it breaks down like this. If you um, buy that plane, you buy the plane on the front, front cover, 
That's an Airbus A321. It's most, along with the Boeing, that's, that's what EasyJet fly. Um, the Boeing equivalent is the Boeing 737, that's what Ryan Air. Those planes make up 75% by number of all commercial passenger aircraft on Earth. They do the bulk of all, the, they're the flight planes you normally fly on. They're worth about $50 million. So when we buy that, we'll put in $10 million of equity and we will put in, we'll find $40 million of debt and that debt will pay down over, over 10 years and we'll own that plane outright. Great, fantastic. What actually happens is this. In 19 times out of 20, the airline will extend the lease for another five or seven years and we'll give them a discount on the second, second time that they do that. And then we re and that plane will, is 10 years old, so it's depreciated now, might be worth $34 million. But that plane is paid, we own that plane outright. So when that customer signs that second lease, we'll go and remortgage that plane. Does it sound familiar to any of the real estate investors out there? We'll remortgage that plane. The bank might give us $20, $25 million. That's obviously enough to buy two more planes. That's what we've been doing for 12 years. That's why we're able to continue to grow. Um, this is the history of the last 50 years of the... Um, this is passenger traffic growth. Passenger traffic growth has been growing at double global GDP for longer than I've been alive. And, you know, I know that Jim talked a lot about the future and, and what young people are doing and how concepts are changing. And one of our biggest shareholders I had lunch with a couple of weeks ago and he said to me, well, what are the disruptors, what are the millennials doing? Well, look, they're not buying houses and they're not going to buy cars but they're travelling more than their parents, twice as much as their parents ever did. So this is, the, this is where passenger traffic is growing and, and, and going. And the global fleet of aircraft, based on that, doubles every 15 years. Incredible. There are 25,000 planes flying today. But there's going to be like, Boeing, both Boeing and Airbus will tell you that there'll be, there's going to be close to 48, 49,000 planes flying by about 2035. You know, there are hundreds of millions of middle-class people created in China over the last 20... And they've... Last year, 100 million Chinese caught their very first flight ever. What do you think is going to happen in India? What's happening all throughout Asia? What's happening in the Western economies which are now growing again and doing better? Passenger traffic growth... Passenger traffic growth in India is over 20% per year, year on year. In China, it's still in the, in the mid-teens. And in places like the US and Europe, still 5-6%. You know going very, very strongly. And it doesn't matter if there's a financial crisis, a terrorist attack, um, a pandemic scare. These are blips on this chart. People don't stop travelling. Humans are natural travellers. That's the list of our fleet. Um, this company made, itself, made a name for itself six or seven years ago by dealing in $20 million 72-seat turboprops, regional planes flying short distances. That plane enabled us, introduced us to all the airlines in the world because that plane flies in, uh, with 200 different airlines in 100 countries of the world. So we went there selling them, introduced ourselves and then taken, used the same skill set to start investing in bigger assets and bigger assets again. And that's why we're able to continue this growth engine. We look at the risk of our portfolio, not only in the, the spread of airplanes and the spread of customers, but the, the key risk metrics, like you look at it, your share portfolio, for us is how old the planes are and how long the leases have got to run. You'll see as that we've continued to grow and invest, these metrics have actually improved. So right now we sit here with the biggest portfolio we ever ha have had. It's the lowest risk portfolio that we've ever had. It's the most diversified portfolio that we've ever had. So it's a better investment than it's ever been before. That's a list of our customers uh, throughout the world, 12 customers. Revenue is about 30% Europe, 30% Asia and 30% Australia. Uh, we're looking to add to that customer list. Um, you know, and, and, and from where we were a couple of years ago, you know, this is a company that started off supplying a couple of regional aircraft to a regional, one single regional airline in Western Australia, which is where I'm from. And we've grown that into a, a, a multinational business with a billion dollars of assets. Uh, and this is a snapshot, you know, you talk about, when I talk about growth, when I talk about, you know, and it's, and I, I don't mean to sound flippant about this, but there are very few companies on the London Stock Exchange that
that could talk seriously about 30% growth, sustained growth year on year. Most companies looking for 3% growth, 5% growth. This is us in the last two and a half years. From 30 June 2015 to 31 December 2017. So this is the company that we were when we had about, I don't know, three, oh, we had $400 million of assets. Now we have over a billion, right? So that's two and a half years. We had $56 million of revenue. We had a handful of customers heavily concentrated into Virgin. We had a market cap of about 75 million pound. Today it's 150 million pound. And I can understand if people said to me, oh, you're a niche business, you're highly leveraged, you're very concentrated, you're a bit small, you're a micro cap. But this is the company that we are today. We've more than doubled the revenues, more than doubled the customers, that diversification of revenue streams has been successfully completed. And so this is a portfolio that's much lower, you know, portfolio of assets that's much lower um, risk than it's ever been. You know, and that's, that's what we intend, we're going to want to do that again. There, there are, Boeing and Airbus make 2,000 plane, brand new planes a year worth $200 billion. We have $1 billion of aircraft. On top of that new equipment, there are seven or 800 planes that are sold secondhand, airlines to lessors, lessors between lessors. Last year, to buy the four aircraft that we delivered into the fleet in December, we probably assessed three or 400. We probably bid on 40, but we won four. And we're happy with that because our rigorous investment criteria means if we buy well, we know we're going to make money. And we're quite happy to bid on lots of stuff, but just win a few. Just like going around to the bank auctions for apartments. You know, we're happily put in low bids for a lot of stuff. But we've developed our business. We believe in our investment criteria. We haven't changed our investment criteria. We haven't changed anything that we've done. And in fact, in 12 years, all that we've effectively done is apply the same business model to, from one plane to the 30, rolled that out 37 times to the fleet that we have today. That's the fleet asset growth. I think if you, uh, if you put the share price growth over that, that'd be pretty highly correlated. So it's been a big year for us this year. Just to sort of finish off, I don't know how am I going for timing, I'm just about there. Um, I, we've got a, obviously got a stand downstairs and I'm, I'm available there for the rest of the day if you've got any first, sort of further questions, but I'll, I'll finish off with this. We've just announced record fleet growth. The great thing about fleet growth is that typically our share price doesn't react to growth. And that's because when you buy a plane, it goes into your balance sheet and the liability attached to that goes into the balance sheet. But those planes that we delivered in December haven't generated any revenue yet. They're only generating that from 1 January. So the people want to see that money go in. They want to sit, wait for our annual report before they buy the shares. That's not the time. To, the time to buy is when we buy the planes because that's when they start generating revenue and earnings. You'll see a big uplift in September when we release our annual report. But, you know, do you reckon the share price is going to be where it is today? Of course it's not. The industry's doing extremely well. Airlines, you know, Warren Buffett for 50 years said never invest in an airline and last year put $12 billion into airlines. Airlines are going extremely strongly at the moment. Um, what they've done, the geniuses, the, what, people don't give airlines enough credit for what they do. What they've done is commoditise the luxury item and that's made it accessible for everybody to fly. So they've increased their market um, uh, their ability to target people um, tenfold. And that's why you know, the, the demand for planes is going. So it's not only available to middle class people, but lower socioeconomic groups are able to fly now. And it's just like getting on a bus. And unfortunately, that's what the experience has become for most of it. You know, big lines at airports, small infrastructure, full planes. British Airways, 15 years ago, was famous for flying one in every three seats empty. Even one of the oldest legacy carries on earth now has 82% bums on seats. And you wonder why IAG's result was good a couple of weeks ago? That's why, because they're filling their planes. Airlines are well-run business. They're getting the benefit of a lower oil price as well. But people don't just attribute it to low oil prices. Um, airlines are well-run businesses. There have been a lot of consolidation in the, in the industry. And they know that if they fill the plane, they will make money. We've diversified our portfolio, lowered risk and grown it to be the biggest that we've ever done. We've also targeted, we're also targeting continual 
lowering costs of debt. And we lowered our cost of debt in the last six months in a rising interest rate environment. And that's because we're a better credit, the debt investors are more familiar with us, we're more diversified and we're lower risk, so they will give us lower cost debt. Um, and we've got opportunity for further, we're looking for planes right now. You know, we, we are a leverage business and I know that some people are concerned about leverage, but we've always had leverage between 70 and 80% and at 31 December it was 77%. But now, because we pay off each of one of our planes every month a little bit, we're probably at 74%. So we've got room to grow and we're looking at planes right now. Um, that's really all I have to say. Um, I'm happy to take questions now if we've got time. Do we have time? Um, I'm happy to take questions from the audience now um, or you can come and visit me at the booth. Uh, we're in through an environment where interest rates seem to be creeping up worldwide. Yeah. How will this affect your business model? Yeah, um, well, let's start with the existing fleet now and existing, investors, uh, invest, <laughs> existing investments. 96% of all of our current debt is either at fixed or hedged interest rates. So that our current fleet has no exposure to rising interest rates. Um, what, we look at, what we're looking at in the future is obviously we're a B plus rated, rated company by S&P and Fitch. I think we're on the cusp of the double B rating. Um, that helps us, um, uh, the bit stronger your rating, the, uh, the, better you, the lower cost of debt you can achieve. Um, and so we're looking to do that. And we've been successful at it, certainly in the, in the past sort of um, couple of years. What we do see, if you look back over 50 years of aviation and leasing, is that interest rates tend to follow um, lease rates. And the reason for that is, is why do interest rates go up? Well, typically it's because economies are doing better. And if economies are doing better, people travel more, there's a lot more business class travel, so on. And if, and if there's more demand from passengers, then you know, the, 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 the airlines will bid higher and higher lease rates. So there is a 50-year correlation between interest rates and lease rates. So if our interest rates go up a little bit but we're able to charge a little bit more, we're about protecting that net interest margin. In fact, our goal is to expand that net interest margin by getting economies of scale. We were 18 people three years ago when we were a third of the size. Now we're 20 people and we've tripled in size. So we're getting economies of scale into our business and we're improving our credit rating. So we do think that we've got um, an opportunity to actually increase the profitability of this business. You're going to get your 30% growth, but we actually think that fundamentally the company will become even more profitable and beyond its 30% growth. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, they, if you, they have to sell a plane. So to get revenue, they have to sell the plane. If they don't sell it, it's not a sale. Um, so look, they, they're happy for companies like us, and we buy every second plane that they produce. They're happy that we're, we're their shop front. We help airlines manage their fleets, change their fleets, transition their fleets. They're manufacturers. They just want to build planes and sell them. Yeah, look, 20 years ago, one in um, eight planes was leased. Today, it's every second plane. Um, it's a very capital-intensive business. Um, it helps them manage their fleet, helps them get access to aircraft. We do lots of things for airlines. Airlines don't necessarily get cheaper debt than we do. Airlines have pension issues, union issues, you know, fuel issues recently. I mean, historically, the airline business hasn't been a great business. All the businesses like us that support airline business have got 50 years of success. You can't say that airlines have got 50 years of success. They've got growing passenger numbers, but that hasn't stopped them going bankrupt. Well, GE is the biggest lessor of aircraft. They have $40 billion worth, but it's only one, it's probably the jewel in the crown of GE. It's probably one of their best businesses. Um, um, GE is doing. <laughs> Well, we could sit here and talk for hours about how badly GE is doing and why it's done badly over the last sort of couple of years. But its leasing business is incredibly strong. You know, it has 1,500 aircraft, continues to add to that fleet um, and continues to do very well. Um, I'm, sh I'm sure someone's thinking about selling and there'd be plenty of buyers for that business because it's a very successful business. But GE is a diversified company doing lots of other stuff other than leasing. 
you are maintaining such a big fleet. Yep. The maintenance is done by the airlines. Done by the airlines. By the airline. By the airline. What our CFO does every month, and it takes him about three minutes, is that he checks that there's 37 rent checks in the bank account. And that's our operational risk taken care of. The 20 people we have working for our organisation are focused on buying the next plane. They're not focused on the 37 that we have. They take care of themselves. Not only do our, our guys check that the rent's paid, our technical guys check that the maintenance is done, but the, you've got federal aid. These aircraft are probably second to nuclear power plants in terms of the most highly regulated assets on Earth. So we've got lots of other people taking care of our assets, probably better than we, they're the 20 people could take care of them. And it's all available on the cloud, it's all available, or the FAAs get it, we get it, we see every nut and bolt that's ever changed on a plane when we check that it's done. So you're quite more in depth in terms of MES, senior, access. Yeah. You pull a depth, you have to pull a history a while ago, you look things pulled out again. Where you are, access to high yield versus bank. Yep. That's a lot of questions. I'll try and, I'll, I'll try and uh, I'll try, I'll try to explain it like this. Historically, as a small company, we're competing against the GEs of the world, right? So they're an investment grade company. They can issue unsecured bonds today at between three and a half and four percent. So they have a lower cost of debt than us. Our cost of debt's four point eight percent. The only way that we can achieve a competitive, similar cost of debt historically over the last twelve years has been to secure the planes with a mortgage, like you do your house. And that has given us access to 4% debt. As we've grown, we've actually started accessing unsecured debt. And that's a really good thing. And I think that's one of the most exciting things this company can do over the next three years, is that we have $800 million worth of debt now and $150 million of it is unsecured. A couple of years ago, it was 100% secured. And so we're able to blend the higher cost debt with cheap senior secured. As our credit rating grows and as we do more unsecured debt issuances, as you get a higher proportion of unsecured debt, say we went to $400 million of unsecured debt, that would unencumber planes on the balance sheet, credit ratings positive, lowers your cost of debt. So it becomes a virtuous circle. I actually think that, <laughs> look, I'm, a, I'm an accountant. I actually think the debt capital structure transition over the next couple of years is the most exciting thing that we're going to do. Because we're going to buy more planes. You know we are, because that's what we've been doing for 12 years. So that growth's going to be there. But I think we're... We're the biggest little leasing company out there. So if, as we improve our credit rating and start funding like the way, that we'll actually be able to buy and compete for more aircraft against the big guys. So I actually think it's a great opportunity for us, not only to lower our cost of debt and increase flexibility in the balance sheet, but able us to compete for more planes on a yearly basis. So I think it has to happen and it will happen. And when we, when we issued $150 million of unsecured debt. That's now almost three years, coming up to three year anniversary. We can call that debt back in and refinance it. If we're able to successfully do that, that'll be, uh, that, like for like, the company will become much more profitable. It'll be a huge event in terms of share price. Your orders and options on the ATR thing, where, where are you hoping the place goes? And uh, is there anything in the pipeline for the more Airbus? Yeah, look, there's three ways you can buy a plane. You can order from the manufacturer, which is what we do with the small stuff. We've had a long um, association with them, a great relationship. We're one of only few um, lessors that deal with ATR, and so we've got a privileged position, get privileged pricing. The two other ways you can buy planes is you either buy them from airlines through a sale and leaseback process, and we've, that's how we bought these jets, or you can buy them from other lessors. And it's like buying a house with a tenant in it. You get the benefit of that tenant and the lease that's attached that plane. So we're quite happy and are able to sustain 30% growth by doing that. We may in the future put in a, a, an order for, but there's a five or six year waiting list for these planes. So it's not going to move the needle for us in the short term, but we're able to grow um, at these high growth rates simply by doing what we've been doing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the finance director. Oh, right. No, look, um, with $200 billion worth of new planes um, manufactured every year, my, my goal, and my goal as a shareholder in this company, is that I want to see it double in size again and then double again. It's really as simple as that. We've created an effective growth platform 
We're doing, uh, we, we can buy more stuff than we can ever buy. We're getting lowest cost debt than we ever, so let's just keep doing what we're doing. And that will drive revenue, will drive earnings, drive EPS and drive the share price. Yeah, if we double the size of this, you know, when, when I spoke here um, five years ago and the share price was 90p, yeah, I, yeah, and then we got to a dollar and I said, oh, well, we're going to get to $2 because we're going to double flee. But people sort of said, oh, that's a bit brash and that's a bit arrogant and, you know, you, you, that, you scare investors when you say stuff like, oh, well, we've, we've walked that talk. We want to do that again. There is actually a lot of M&A activity in this sector at the moment. Um, you've had um, AWAS um, being bought by uh, DAE, one of our competitors, NAC, who's uh, been bought. You've had Avalon being bought by the Chinese. Uh, that's a good, th good... If somebody wants to come and buy our company, they can bid for it on the stock exchange. And, you know, we, we know that our company's worth a lot more than it is worth today. And so, they, you know, if they have to bid at very high levels, then... Good on them. It's a great outcome for our shareholders. Uh, the next question I have is, are you uh, planning to get aircraft to order? Or do all the aircraft, all the aircraft, all the aircraft then find the customer? Yeah, with these, with these, that's what you do. You, you sort of have the aircraft on order. You put that order in a year or two in advance and you've got those couple of years to go and find that customer. That's how we've been doing that for the last you know, six or seven years. And we do three or four aircraft, five, five a year that way. Um, well, that's one of the reasons why we don't put in big orders for jets, because that's a financial commitment. You've got to pay that bill eventually, so you've got to make sure you've got that customer. We, we don't want to take a lot of speculative risk. And of the six orders, how many won't have they been uh, repeat customers with bigger um, I, I actually think that all six will probably be like, well, there's, there's, we're talking to existing customers, so there's some potential there. We expect to do three this calendar year and three next calendar year. Um, but you know, until the lease is assigned, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll disclose who they go to then. Any other questions? Yep. Could you check with Fokker that we are uh, balance sheet price? <laughs> um, look, the Fokkers, uh, we announced last year that we converted those to finance lease. So they're on, they're on finance lease with Virgin Australia. When they pay the last rent check, they own the plane. So they, they're effectively sold. Uh, they're also immaterial. In the, of the billion dollars, of the, of the $1,008 million, they probably represent the eight. And they're, but they're 22, that's, they've lived their lives. They've done exactly what we expect planes to do. They've paid themselves off a number of times. They've generated enormous profits and revenue for the company and the old stuff has to go. That's how you keep your fleet young. And you also release equity to buy more planes, keep growth going. Uh, we don't put the options on that. I think there's two options on the balance sheet. We've, a few years ago, if you look at our thing, 2015 or 2016 annual return, we sold a couple of options and we made a million and a half dollar profit on each one. They're not on the balance sheet. And, you know, the fact that we've made, we sold 17 planes for a profit out of 18 means that we're very conservative on our balance sheet. You know, we sold six planes, I think, last year in 2017. Uh, they were eight, they were some of these and some of these, which at the time represented 90% of our balance sheet. We made profits on all of them. So I think you can be relatively comfortable um, that our, our assets are, are, are conservatively valued on the balance sheet. One more question? Yeah, what's the industry uh, definition of an old plane? And who are the ultimate buyers of old planes? The ultimate buyers are typically um, uh, the airlines. They do find a use for them on peripheral routes when they get cheap and they've got spare parts available. Well, the reason why airlines hang on to planes is that because they've done all the maintenance, they know the full history of the plane, um, it's a plane that's familiar with them and so they generally tend to just, we tend to turn them into finance leases and then they'll own them outright at the end. There are some leasing companies that actually specialise in old aircraft, you know, 17 year old aircraft. And 17 year old aircraft generate high yields. Um, than young aircraft, and I'll, I'll explain quickly why that is. If you buy a $50 million plane, put it on a 10-year lease, um, and you get whatever you, you might get, you know, $5 million a year for that plane in rent. Well, in year 10, you're still getting $5 million a year rent, but on the denominator, the, you've got a depreciated asset, so its yield in year 10 is much higher, even though you'd cash, the cash that you're getting is still the same. So some guys buy old planes, depreciated planes, to try and maximise their yield. We, as investors, are very conservative. We'd rather buy the younger stuff 
because it's got because a plane lowers its risk by having a long income earning potential. So we invest in that lower risk corner of the market. So what is an old plane from the ovation? From the ovation, what we'd like to keep a plane typically to midway through the second lease. So that might be 10 or 12 years on the first lease, five to seven years on the second lease. So we're happy to sell between 15 and sort of 17 years. But if somebody comes along and make, you know, look, we, we had somebody come along last year and try to buy half the planes off us. And we told them, no, we wouldn't grow our fleet. We ended up selling them six. We made a really good profit on it. So if people are going to pay stupid money for our, for our assets, and we can find other assets to, and that's what we did. We sold $100 million worth of stuff and we bought $300 million worth of stuff. So we're still keeping the growth engine going. Um, and so in terms of mid-life plane is you know, 12, 12 years old. You know, End-of-life plane is 20 plus years. Well, we do everything in US dollars. Um, the best example I can, the best example uh, I can give you is not going to answer your question because when Brexit happened and the pound dropped overnight, our share price dropped overnight, and it should have gone up by fifteen percent. But it's because people panic sell. It's the more about the sentiment of the market. Um, so you know, I think that um, um, you know we, our fleet is valued in US dollars. So you, the the foreign exchange risk you take is converting on the, on the day. So we're, I know we're trading below net book value now in terms of pounds. So I think it's, you know, and that's, this is a company that grows at 30% a year. It's on a PE of nine or 10. And it's trading below book value of its assets. It's cheap. Um, well, we're talking to people now there, we expect delivery of the first, they, they, they now have sort of set delivery dates in the, the first three in the second half of this calendar year and the others are in 2000, the other three are in 2019. But we can buy planes other ways, like you know, from straight from airlines or straight from other lessors. So I do expect to see other growth from us in between now and then. You say you make a profit on these planes when you sell them after 17 years. Yeah. Do you include all the rental <coughs> that you've gained? No. No, no, that's just that's that's the it's in the balance sheet at X, and if you sell it for plus X, you make a gain on sale. No, 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 no. You bought it for fifty; it it'll, it depreciates at three point four percent. So after ten years, it's worth sixty five percent of because you've taken the depreciation to the P and L. So if it's worth say thirty five million dollars after ten years, if you sell it for thirty six, you make a gain. If you sell it for thirty four, you make a loss. If you make, sell it for thirty five, make nothing. We, uh, we're pretty industry standard in that we depreciate them um, in a straight line over 25 years to scrap value, which is about 3.4% a year. I think we've run out of time. Yep. Is there someone following me who's waiting to get on? Because I can sit here and answer questions all day if you like. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, come and see me at the booth anyway if you've got any more questions. Thank you. Thank you.